Hello and welcome to The Steward, MST's podcast exploring all things antimicrobial stewardship and infection control. I'm Mike Johnson, Associate Director of Policy and Communications at MSD, and each episode I'll be talking to a different expert on their experience of antimicrobial resistance and how we can translate this into effective antibiotic stewardship here in the UK. A reminder, all contributions by experts invited onto this show, be this comments, factual claims or otherwise, are grounded in their own personal experiences, have not been influenced by MSD, and nor indeed do they represent the views of MSD. That said, we couldn't be more delighted to have them here with us to discuss this incredibly important field of medicine. So, without further ado, let's meet today's guest. Okay, hello everyone, um, and welcome to episode two of The Steward, brought to you by MSD. Um, I've got a really nice, lovely guest here today to talk to us about the subject of antimicrobial resistance, otherwise known as AMR, and in particular, its impact on patients. I, for one, am really looking forward to it. I think before we get into that, very quickly, this is episode two, and the preliminary feedback from episode one was that as wonderful a discussion as that was, one of the key questions I got was, why on earth is this series called The Steward? Well, very quick explanation. We are essentially talking to stewards, people who take care and make sure antibiotics stay and remain effective in the fight against drug resistant bugs. And that might bring to mind in the first instance, someone like a doctor, and you'd be correct. It might bring to mind someone like a scientist who's developing new drugs against drug resistant bacteria, and you would also be right. But the fight is across many fronts and includes a wide range of individuals, such as today's guest, which I'm delighted to introduce. So Arlene, if I may, please feel free to introduce yourself and the organization that you work for. Thank you, Mark. I'm delighted to be here with you. My name's Arlene Braley, and I'm working as patient support for a charity called Antibiotic Research UK. Um, we believe we're the only and the first charity actually fighting antibiotic resistance and the only charity to be offering patient support to those suffering with resistant infections. Wow, what, what, what an opening claim. I mean, um, and uh, fantastic, therefore, to have you here with us today. I, for one, have worked in this field for several years, and I'm, yes, I'm definitely aware. Indeed, I think Dame Sally Davies, the former Chief Medal Officer for the UK, mentioned this. There is actually um, quite a lack of patient voice or indeed number of patient-focused organisations in this field of medicine. Um, wh why don't we start there? I mean, um, you, you are in a very special place, but why do you think that is? Why, why is Antibiotic Research UK so unique? Well, I, I think the very reason you've outlined the lack of patient voice and that actually is due to the fact of the lack of patient support. So our charity recognised this. It was set up in 2014 by Professor Colin Garner. And the main aims when it set out were to educate and uh, the public and professionals about the danger of antibiotic resistance and how to prevent it. And the main aim at that point was to enable and discover new antibiotics and new combinations against resistant bacteria. But they very quickly realised that there were patients out there suffering with these infections and they had no support, they had no one to turn to, they had no one to help them find reliable, trustworthy information. And so just over a year ago, um, I came into post to provide that very role, patient support and information. Right. So I, I think um, we've, we've got a fair bit of time and I would like to really delve into that role that you've just described, Darlene, because it is unique. And I think there's a great number of listeners to this episode that will really want to find out what your kind of day job consists of and, and also the, the kinds of varying different experiences um, you, are, you are privileged to see and be a part of. So, but before we do so, again, one of the feedbacks from episode one was um, it was a fantastic discussion on sepsis. But it was relatively late in the episode that we actually sought to cover um, some of the basics around AMR, antimicrobial resistance. So one of the things I had to do was remind myself to, for example, to stop using acronyms all the time, such as AMR and AMS, antimicrobial stewardship, and just revisit some of those basics. So I think you're the perfect person to do that with before we delve into maybe your role. So maybe if I can just bounce uh, a couple of headline statistics off of you. So so one thing that I think um, myself and many 
working in the industry or working in the field of AMR um, jumped on a few years ago was the 2016 what's called the O'Neill Report, which was uh, it was called that because it was led by Lord Jim O'Neill, who led a global review into the burden of antimicrobial resistance AMR. And one of the key statistics to come out of that very large report and very helpful report was the projection that 10 million lives could be lost as a result of AMR by 2050. And moreover, that would equal more than cancer and diabetes combined. That That is hugely shocking. When that report came out, um, did, you, did you find that particularly surprising? And also, do you think that's helpful to describe AMR in that kind of language? I, I think it's surprising for anyone that reads it. Um, shocking, perhaps, would be the word to use. And I think those of us that have worked in the field of antibiotic resistant infection and AMR, it probably came as less as a, a surprise. But my sense is that the general public don't really grasp what this is all about. I actually don't think they understand what it's all about. Yep. So I think we need to start coining terms, using language, talking in everyday terms to help them to understand that. So, for example, I think it's important that we need to describe to people what that means. In the years to come, if we don't have antibiotics that work against these resistant infections, that means people could actually die of a simple cut or a scratch. It means that the knee and hip replacements that we take for granted today, they might not be able to go ahead because of insufficient antibiotics to both prevent any wound infections or the ones that arise after surgery. It could even mean that caesarean sections become risky because, of course, antibiotics are very important in that whole process. So I think if we can explain better what that means to people in everyday terms for things that they recognise in their lives, it maybe would have more of an impact then. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And you know what, this is going. This next bit is going to sound like it was set up, but your answer was entirely spontaneous. Um, if li listeners can uh, can trust me there, and I think it's really fortuitous that you uh, gave the answer that you did, because the one, the next thing I wanted to mention was the late 2019 report by the Wellcome Trust called Reframing Resistance, which said exactly what you've just said, Arlene, which is basically these figures of quoting 10 million lives by 2050. And indeed, there was going to be an accompanying projected cost to the global economy of $100 trillion. It's, it is shocking. And I think um, myself and others jumped on that initially because those of us working in this field, we, we care really passionately about the subject and we want people to get it. But I think I agree with the Wellcome Trust findings, which is when you talk about AMR in those kinds of terms, it, it kind of puts it in the bucket of this is a problem of tomorrow, not a problem of today. Um, so if I can just quote the Wellcome Trust, which again at the end of last year basically gave an answer which is very similar to you. So how should we be talking about resistance? Well, if I quote, infections become drug resistant when the bacteria that cause them adapt and change over time developing the ability to resist the drugs designed to kill them. The result is that many drugs, like antibiotics, are becoming less effective at treating illnesses. Our overuse of antibiotics in both humans and animals is speeding up this process. Without working antibiotics, routine surgery like hip replacements, common illnesses like diarrhea and minor injuries from accidents, even including cuts, can become life-threatening. People are already dying from drug-resistant infections, and as more drugs stop working, more lives will be put in danger. Drug-resistant infections can affect anyone. We are all at risk of infections from drug-resistant bacteria. We can solve the problem by taking action now to develop new drugs and to make sure the drugs we already have stay effective. We can protect ourselves, our families and our communities. So apologies for that um, little bit long-winded explanation of what AMR is, but I think it really, really neatly captures what you've just said and frames it as a problem of today and not tomorrow. But what it also does is touch on stewardship, the AMS side of the AMR problem. So I know, given your own personal background, you'll probably have a better explanation of this than me, Arlene, but what does AMS mean to you, stewardship? It's a good question, Mark. And, and I think my answer is dependent on what hat I'm wearing. So my own background <laughs> is as a pharmacist, predominantly in education, but I did work with the Scottish Antimicrobial Prescribing Group. 
So I was used to the term stewardship, you know, the idea of preserving and optimising our, our valuable antimicrobials, using them appropriately. But, you know, I would never use that language in my patient support role. Right. Because patients just wouldn't understand any of those terms. Sure. So I think we have to really start thinking carefully, as the Wellcome Trust has, has recommended about how we speak. So I talk to patients about using antibiotics correctly and even simplifying it to the right time and the right dose mm -hmm. instead of using the word appropriate. I would talk about keeping antibiotics and using carefully when we really need them and not using them when we don't need them. For example, colds, flus, things like that. I would never use the term inappropriate use. You know, even AMS, AMR, it means yes. nothing to the patients. And uh, uh, just this week, in fact, I had an email from a patient saying, can you explain to me what MDR and gram negative and yes. AMS all stand for? Because I keep reading this and I don't know. So part of that is actually simplifying the message for patients and the general public to understand. So I mentioned in the introduction that there are a range of stewards out there all fulfilling their different roles. And, and one of the key roles is that public education and awareness, which for some of us is, is harder than it's harder for some than it is, is for others, because some are more scientifically orientated, some are more policy orientated, and, and some are just much closer to patients like yourself. So if, if you don't mind, um, if we could get into your role, um, some of the specifics, your kind of day to day working and indeed the nature and work of the charity Antibiotic Research UK, that that would be great. So let's kind of keep it a, a fairly open brief um, and I'm happy to be led by you here, Arlene. But why not? Let's let's start by describing, if you may, what what typically consists of a, a working day for you um, and what kind of key themes would you like to put across to the, the listeners in terms of what are the concerns of patients in this area? I think the important thing to see is the role is really about patients. What do they need? What, what are they asking for? How can I help and support them? So I think the first thing to see is in everything that I've been trying to build around this role, it's important that I stress to you and the listeners and to others that I'm not there to give personal medical advice. So even though I'm a pharmacist, I'm approaching this role as a support role. It's information giving, it's signposting, it's listening more than anything. So what I would find is patients would call me up by phone, they would email, sometimes they contact us through the website, sometimes through social media. And many of these patients actually are feeling incredibly isolated. The impact of antibiotic resistance on everyday life is perhaps not well understood by even their friends, their colleagues, their family, mm. and they're struggling to just come to terms with what's happening to them, or they may just have simple questions that they can't answer, you know, such as, I've had four different antibiotics, does that mean I've got a resistant infection? It can be as simple as that, or it can be much more in depth. I mean, I'd like to tell you the story perhaps of Sharon, um, she was one of my earliest calls and she emailed actually rather than called and said, I've just been told I've got ESBL E. coli and I've no idea what that is and I've just come out of hospital. So I think her story illustrates for me really well what my role is all about. So I listen to her story, I try and distill down the issues within it. Um, often there's questions that patients don't have answers to or they found information online that's really, you know, quite erroneous, but they don't know whether to believe it or whether not to. And sometimes it's about me providing them information that we've put together in Antibiotic Research UK, or sometimes signposting to other um, areas of help. Quite often it's about helping them to work out what questions they need to ask their GP or their specialist or perhaps the healthcare team, that's that distilling down the issues. So we also have a website that um, we've put together information there about these resistant infections, such as really tract infections, which are the most common calls I get actually, or skin and soft tissue. We're working on one to do with lung infections. And the website has a whole host of information around general infection too. If I go back to Sharon, she said, what are these ESBL E. coli's? And it turned out that she'd been admitted to hospital very suddenly. 
She'd become really unwell at home after sinusitis, she thought, but she'd had a number of UTIs in, in the recent months. She suddenly became very listless. She became very feverish. She started to get very confused and her husband rushed her into e and &E, quite rightly. But as she sat there in the waiting room, she told me that she had to take herself up to the nurse and say, do you know, I think I need to be seen right now. I believe I've got sepsis. Gosh. It really was, you know, that's, that's how shocking it can be. And the nurse, of course, was a bit taken aback, wasn't quite sure about this. And she said, no, seriously, you need to believe me because I've had it before. And it turned out that Sharon was actually at that point going into septic shock. Her blood pressure had dropped. She was seriously ill and she was rushed into a treatment. Now, the good news is she had, you can imagine, very powerful intravenous antibiotics and she did recover from that. But the question she had arose out of that period of treatment because she was in a general ward for a couple of weeks and then she was moved into a room in isolation. And she said, nobody explained to me what was happening. I didn't know why I was moved into this room on my own. She said, just before I was discharged home, still feeling really ill, she said, one of the nurses said to me, oh, that's right, you've got ESBL E. coli. And that was all she was told. So she had no information. She didn't understand what that was. She knew it related to bacteria of some kind. And this was her getting home and saying to me, can you help me tell me what this is? Because I don't know what that means. Can I live in the same house as my family? Can I cook for them? Can, can we touch each other? Am I going to infect them? What does that mean for me? So that for me illustrates, I think, how there, there is a real role here for supporting patients through these very difficult times of coming to terms with what's happening to them, but also filling the gaps of the information and the knowledge that they need to get on with, with their lives. Gosh, I mean, what a what a story. I think on the one hand, obviously, delighted to hear that there was a successful treatment outcome. But at the same time, that it still sounds like quite a harrowing time. Um, very, um, no doubt, very, very anxious time for, for that patient. Is that, would you say that's quite a typical experience, Arlene? Or was, it, was that somewhat of an exception? I would say it's it's not typical, but many of the patients that I speak to have probably been living with ongoing resistant infection for quite a while. So they have quite dramatic stories behind them. And actually, Arlene, forgive me for interrupting, because that's a really key point. I think um, even those that have been working in the field for some time often forget that this can be a long term thing. So often um, much of the debate is focused around the treatment in hospital stage um, and then post discharge um, that that can sometimes be forgotten. So, yeah, if you wouldn't mind just touching on that, because I think that's really important. This this can be and indeed is for many patients a long term thing. That's right. I think the, the, the shocking thing really is that every single patient has said to me, I didn't really know about antibiotic resistance until I found myself with an infection. And that brings us back to the whole issue of how do we raise public awareness? I think the bottom line is until someone experiences it themselves or someone in their family or friendship group, then it has no real meaning. And then suddenly it has quite an awful meaning for them because one patient has described it as living with a chronic condition because quite often these resistant infections either recur or they, they're just not eradicated from the word go. Yeah, no, and, and, and I think um, you're absolutely right. And I'm sure the same goes for many conditions, but obviously in some therapy areas, there's much stronger um, patient voice or, or organized groups which advocate um, these these kinds of concerns and that sometimes results in meaningful policy change. I think one thing I would like to pick up on now now is maybe the appropriate time. What, what do you think the role of the media is here? Because one thing I remember is uh, more than a decade ago now actually, you'll recall within the UK there was um, a, something of a MRSA outbreak and um, indeed C. diff uh, was another concern as well. I think those two pathogens, uh, infections, are as a result somewhat known amongst the general public in terms of threats um, that can indeed be hospital acquired. 
but do you think that was almost a, a flash in the pan or do you think there's maybe lessons to be learned from those kinds of episodes at the same time you know on the other side of the coin do you think there is perhaps an issue with the way AMR is reported in the media sometimes is it helpful or not to be using terms like superbugs which obviously has a very fearful uh, connotations uh, with it um, again appreciate that's a bit of a broad question I think what I'm asking really is what do you foresee the role of the media being here and, and does that need to be tweaked in terms of the messaging oh there's a lot in there mark I, I think <laughs> sorry if we, start with, if we start with that term super bug that's one of my bug beers i have to be honest it's <laughs> it's one of those clever terms isn't it but actually i think it conveys entirely the wrong message to people mm. if you think of of children talking about their superheroes they're strong they're powerful and they're usually a force for good and of course, superbugs are strong and powerful, but they are certainly not a force for good. And so I think we mix the message when we use that term superbug. So, you know, there's a new competition to run in the media. What should we call these <laughs> bugs? <laughs> but I think the media have a really important role to play. You know, for example, in um, Antibiotic Research UK, we're often in touch with the media and we're, we're you know, helping them to tell patient stories because we know that's the powerful way for people to understand. For example, just recently we had a story in, in the Manchester News which was all about Lisa's situation. Now, Lisa is a, a young woman who suffered for many years with, with several resistant infections. She was born prematurely and her esophagus was attached to her lungs. And without getting into all the detail um, because of time, you can imagine that over time she had to have peg feeding. That's the tube that goes into the stomach for feeding. And that has set up lots and lots of infections over the years that have become resistant and can clear up. At the same time, she also had a spine problem that has meant that different rods that were placed in her spine made her liable to infection as well and she quite often takes bouts of pneumonia now for a young woman this has completely changed her life you know she's not been able to go out and do a normal and paid employment job mm. but she's the most wonderful volunteer i've ever met but she would tell the story of how that changes everything she does and she has periods where her mental health is affected by all of this and then she'll go on to talk about how a lot of her volunteer work really gives meaning to that, where she can use her experience to help other people understand. Now, it made the news because at that time, she, you can imagine she was shielding during the coronavirus pandemic. She had to shield even in her own bedroom within her own house because her parents were both working and they, of course, were usually her carers. So that created quite a, I just think, a very sad picture, isn't it, of this young woman having to shield within her own home. And that was the same weekend that the police had to close down about 600 parties that were happening illegally around the city. And so the media were contrasting, here's a young woman, you know, who's got a lot of suffering going on, resistant infection, has to shield um, from COVID-19 as against those who are perhaps a bit thoughtless in the fact that they could be the cause of someone becoming ill next. So the media has a really important role to play in telling the patient's story. I think they have to do it very sensitively and very carefully because these are people's lives and these are people's own experiences. And you can imagine if they're told in the wrong way, it can have a very detrimental effect. Yes, absolutely. But the wonderful thing I find with the patients I speak to, and I, I encourage them if they're willing to tell their story, to tell their experience, because they find it quite cathartic in some ways. But more than that, they actually want it to do some good. And they often tell their experience in the form of a case study or a story because they know that others will be able to relate to it and it'll yeah. suddenly become real and they want to make a difference they actually want to fight the problem of antibiotic resistance by playing their part yeah and that's i i, I mean that's uh, again that's a really admirable admirable story um and, and i i definitely echo your point there around the sensitivity and the need to tell the story in, in the right way i think that's a responsibility that falls on all of us that want to make a difference in this area 
You mentioned COVID-19. Um, now, we are recording it indeed still at a time of lockdown, and I did want to touch on that uh, in a minute because we, we must indeed uh, acknowledge the elephant in the room right now. But before, before we do so, I, I wanted to pick up on a point there, which was almost, I, I, do correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it sounds to me that some of these patients you talk to, COVID-19 has exacerbated the, the, the situation, um, not somewhat, but quite a lot. But outside of this situation, before this situation, would you say for some of these patients, they were already in a sense of lockdown because they are indeed, for some of them, in, incredibly vulnerable? Is it, would would that be true to say? Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. And that comes as a surprise to many people. I mean, if I can use the example of, of my own son, my son is 25 and he lives with a chronic infection and he's been housebound for the last five or six years. In fact, that's the reason I'm doing this role, because I feel I can relate to the patients and the carers who need information, who need support and can't find it. And when we were talking about COVID-19 and lockdown the other week or two, he said to me, do you know, I don't know why everybody's complaining about these weeks of lockdown. He said, I've been living in lockdown in force for years. And he laughed. But that's the reality of people who are living with chronic infection. Their life can change from day to day. Um, one or two of the patients I've spoken to recently have said to me one of the biggest problems they have is trying to explain to family and friends why they can be okay one day, but they're not the next day. And often they'll look physically well, so there's no way of telling, but actually the symptoms and the illness that they experience within their body can, can be life changing in that way. So they make plans for tomorrow, but they don't know if they can actually carry them through till tomorrow comes. And that must carry with it a huge mental health burden at the same time. And I imagine things like employment is, is incredibly difficult, as is arranging anything in terms of socially with friends or indeed organising things like holidays. That's right. I'm thinking here of Nina, who, who um, shared her story with us a while back. She said to me that she cannot actually plan a holiday or even a day out without working out where is the nearest a &E department. So part of their planning for the day is where is the nearest hospital. That really took me aback when she said that. And, and her story is one that could happen to any of us. She had a gallbladder operation about nine years ago. And from that gallbladder operation, there were complications at the time. And it ended up that she developed this ongoing resistant infection. And it seems to be multi-infections because they can't quite determine exactly what the, the bugs are. But it means that she is now maintained on a cocktail of antibiotics, which are rotated every few months. Yep. Just, you know, a few, maybe, maybe about a year ago, I think, she was told by the consultant that there were fewer options now that they had to treat these infections. And it was now taking longer to get the infection under control when it flared up. So, of course, that has quite a detrimental effect, doesn't it, on, on how you live, how you think, how you plan. And uh, she was the one who said to me that, you know, we have to plan when we're going out just exactly where we're going and what facilities are there. But, you know, at the end of it all, she's still very upbeat and really wants to make a difference in spite of what she's living with. And it, it might be helpful for me just to quote what she said to me. This is her words. I would really like to know what the future holds, but no one seems to know or understand if I'll always have these infections or what might happen. I feel I've had this wake up call and life's too short not to make the most of each day now. She says, I didn't know about antibiotic resistance before my illness, but now I want to play my part in making a difference. Oh, wow. Isn't that tremendous for a patient who's suffering with all those ongoing resistant infections to be able to say that? Absolutely. I mean, hugely inspirational. And, and I'm sure there's people that are finding it a really difficult time now or in the future. And if they hear something like that, you know, I really hope... Um, that, that gives them a glimmer of hope that there are people out there who, uh, as you've just demonstrated, are going through so much, but can absolutely make, make such a difference at the same time. So, Arlene, I, I, I think, um, as I said, um, it's only right and proper, given the times that we're in right now, that we do um, acknowledge briefly um, COVID. I think you've already touched on 
uh, how it can um, exacerbate the almost daily lockdown that some patients are going through already. But how has it, to date, because acknowledging this is uh, still an ongoing thing, how has it kind of affected the work of the charity from an Antibiotic Research UK perspective? In, in many ways, I have to say, um, I mean, it's affected personal lives and working conditions for each of us, for you, for me, for everyone. But I think for charities, there has been a huge knock on effect in that by, by its very nature, we're dependent on donations and fundraising. And of course, the lockdown has meant that none of that can happen. So the marathon that was due to run in London, um, gala fundraising, dinner, sporting events, things that we are very dependent on at Antibiotic Research UK, all of those funding streams have obviously stopped for the, the, the moment. And roles like mine are supported out of that fundraising and donation work. So I think that's one of the immediate problems and charities like ourselves are having to look at how, how can we overcome in that, in that moment. And on that note, I, I hope it's appropriate to say, you know, we would love anybody out there listening to this podcast who would like to support the work that we're doing. Can I direct them to the, the website where there's lots of information of how they can get involved? You know, whether they're sporty people or baking people or whatever it might be, we have lots of events and support there that we could help people get involved or simply to donate if they're able to. In yeah. terms of the charity itself, um, we're obviously looking at how does that relate to our purpose? And of course, there's a very clear link there with the fact that sadly, many people who become seriously ill with COVID-19 are developing secondary bacterial infections. Many of those can be resistant bacterial infections as well. So we're very, very clearly linked to what's going on there. We're watching and we're involved and we're actively talking to those on the front line as well. So our website has developed a few new features you may have noticed recently. We've done quite a few blogs around the whole coronavirus and secondary bacterial infection issue and, and all the issues related to coronavirus because people want trustworthy answers. They want to know that where they go, they're going to get reliable answers. And we've even started a new feature called Ask Antruck, Antruck being the shortened name for Antibiotic Research UK. Sure. So people can type in a question if, if they have one and we'll do our best to answer it. And we put a new question up every day. So we're trying very hard to help people, to help the public, to help the patients in this time of, of COVID-19. But I suppose the other side of the story is we have patients contacting us who say, I'm really worried because am I more at risk because I have resistant infections already? Am I more at risk because my immune system's fighting off recurring infection? And that, of course, provides its own um, concern and, and issues that we're trying to address as part of what we're doing. So I think the whole COVID-19 has given a lot of challenges and we've all experienced them. And the charity, of course, as I say, like others has. But I think there's some opportunity as well here, perhaps in the, in the whole fight against antibiotic resistance to try and maybe find some silver linings with this, this awful time. Sure. And thanks, thanks again for that, Arlene. And just to reassure listeners who may be uh, interested by that and after more information, if you're linking through to this recording by YouTube, please uh, see below in the comments uh, description section, rather, where we'll, of course, post a link to Antibiotic Research UK's website. Arlene, you mentioned that the fundraising efforts underpin essentially everything that the, the charity does. One of the functions um, I've, I've seen your charity fulfill is on the advocacy and campaigning front for meaningful policy change. So one of the one of the questions I wanted to ask you next was you are, as indeed I alluded to at the very beginning of this uh, episode, you are one of those individuals who are absolutely at the coalface um, in an essential role supporting patients, indeed coming much closer to their concerns than, than many people do. So with those um, privileged insights that you have, um, from a policy perspective, if there was kind of one or two big key asks of policymakers, and when I say policymakers, I mean government broadly, the NHS as well as a whole. If there was one or, one or two key things that you, you really wanted to see change in the near future, 
would you be able to name those or or is it um a case of lots and lots of i'm sure there's lots of things that we'd all want to see change but i, I think my question is uh, is is there one or two things that really shine out can i just check do you mean from a, a patient perspective mark or just generally from the charity point of view well, good question in itself. So uh, let's let's take let's take both. So um, the, the former first, from a patient support perspective, maybe. So from a patient perspective, I think it's really important to put that patient face on everything that we do. I think it's important for researchers, for government um, individuals, for all those policy makers, for clinicians, to always remember that there's a patient at the end of everything that we do. In the last few months, I've, I've had a number of invitations to speak at events of researchers or um, looking at the whole AMR agenda. And uh, interestingly, I'm always the first speaker on the day. And that's very purposeful because I think those arranging the events have recognised that it's important to put that patient face right at the front of everything that we're doing. Absolutely. And if I, if I can just say to interrupt, um, if, if I may, indeed, that's why we started episode one with uh, the Sepsis Trust and now episode two with Antibiotic Research UK. You know, our intent is to talk to a wide range of individuals working in this field. But, you know, we recognise that, um, that the patient voice, it's really essential we upfront this series with just what you're talking about. I, I've noticed, you know, people that have come to speak to me and have contacted me later on have said, actually, I hadn't really appreciated what patients were living with, were living through. I hadn't understood the issues that they have to deal with on a daily basis. And suddenly I realised that the work I'm doing is even more important. You know, so there is something very powerful about the patient face and the patient voice in everything that we're trying to do with the AMS agenda. In, in terms of actually progress, I, this is a personal view really. But I think there's a number of things that, that we we need to encourage our policymakers, our governments, perhaps even globally to do. And that's things like we have to perhaps take COVID-19 as the example of it came upon us. We didn't quite see the scale of what was coming at us. And we perhaps, you know, would do things differently next time. I think we've got a, an opportunity here to use that for good in the fight against antibiotic resistance. We need new antibiotics, we need new treatments, we need new combinations, we need to find ways of overcoming this, but we need to do it now before the pandemic, if I can call it that, of AMR hits us in the future. I also think there's an issue here that will be known to some listeners, maybe not to others, which is we need to think about how we fund the development of new antibiotics. The old model of pharmaceutical industry being um, reimbursed based on volume and numbers of treatment works very well for most medicines in the chronic conditions. So if, for example, if you're on medicines for coronary heart disease or diabetes, you're going to be taking that medicine for a long time and regular doses. But the model for antibiotic development doesn't work for that because you can imagine if we have new antibiotics developed, we want to hold them. Um, for those instances where we really need something that will work when others have failed, we really want to treat people for as short a time as possible, three, five, seven days. And, and that means that the model for reimbursement and for encouraging companies to make new antibiotics and find new antibiotics, it makes it very difficult within that current model. So I would encourage all of those involved in this to think about how we can do that better. And, uh, you know, our charity does a lot of work itself in the research field and in looking at new combinations of treatments. Antibiotic Research UK are also looking at non-antibiotic treatments as well. So we have to be very creative about how we do that in the future. Great. And, uh, you know, actually, I couldn't have said it better myself and it's my job. <laughs> so maybe on upon release of this podcast, um, we'll be making myself redundant. So thank you for that, Ali. Uh, <laughs> no, honestly, it's a really good, um, really, really good point. And, and indeed, maybe it, it could be a uh, one of our focus sessions for a, a future episode. So I think we're coming uh, near the end of our time, perhaps five or so minutes left. 
I think it's really open to you in terms of um, any remaining points you wanted to make. But if I may, I think you've demonstrated through mentioning a series of case studies on this on this call, you know, the the really a personal nature. I, I, you provided the patient face, which, as we touched on at the beginning, is I feel is so often lacking in this space. One thing I would ask you, which can maybe lead us into a, a conclusion, is are you, are you aware of any efforts by any other organizations or any other individuals which you would like to shout out as being particularly good successes, um, whether it be from a, a general stewardship perspective or indeed similar to your own work, kind of um, highlighting the concerns and um, daily lives of patients in this area? Yeah, so uh, again, uh, it's a somewhat broad question, but I am keen that throughout this series, we try and highlight best practices where we can, um, you certainly being one of them, but you're in contact with, I'm sure, many like-minded individuals. So are there any any other efforts that you'd like to, to shout out? And indeed, if you want to talk about the national efforts that Public Health England and others do, please do so. But um, I'm conscious there might be something at a sub-national level that you wanted to shout out. Well, Mark, where to start with that one? Um, I think there are so many people who are doing wonderful work in this field. If, if there were one comment I would make, it's perhaps that you know we're working in silos and there's maybe room for us actually to be much more joined up and work together more closely. So, and that would make it difficult for me to, you know, to, to call out names of different organisations here sure, in the, and I sure. talked to quite a few, I talked to other charities um, and we agree to, you know, to refer one to the other, depending on the issue. Um, obviously, there's Public Health England and Public Health Scotland and, and other um, big organisations like that that are doing a whole host of work. Uh, and in fact, I'm, I'm working with them on a particular project related to community pharmacy. So there's a pilot ongoing. Um, I'm not sure how far it will have got with the COVID-19 pandemic, but the idea is that in these pilot pharmacies, any person collecting a prescription for an antibiotic will have a discussion with the pharmacy staff and it will allude to do they know how to take them correctly, encourage them to finish the course, ask if there's any questions. And importantly for me, it will look at whether they've had antibiotics in the last two or three months and if so, raise the issue about antibiotic resistance. And at that point, they have information to be able to contact us as well. So there, there's lots of work going on there and I would love to see us be much more joined up like that. I think that's a good example of how we can all work together. And there's obviously there's a, a lot of work goes on with the antibiotic guardians. There's the World um, Antibiotic Awareness Week in November, where we all have a huge effort. We, that's when we predominantly hold. We do, we do. <laughs> of of uh, events and even Antibiotic Research UK, we have our tea party at that time of the year, the Great British Tea Party, which is not just fundraising; it's raising awareness at a time when people are focused. So I think we could all do a lot better working together because so many people out there are doing such a great job in in their own field. They are indeed, and um, you, start, you sounded doubtful there for a moment um, around an answer to give Arlene, but I think you gave the, the perfect example, if, 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 if I'm honest. Sorry, you want to say something else? Well, the, the one thing in my mind that I'm thinking about really is how we all work together to try and, I, we talked about a silver lining in this COVID-19 pandemic. I'm wondering if there's scope for us all to work together now with what has been learned so far? So I'm thinking of the public message here. You know, we've all learned about washing our hands being the most important way of, yes. of uh, yeah. protecting ourselves. If we can carry some of those messages forward, that's surely going to help us in this fight against antibiotic resistance. We've even got school children and young people who are actually learning that this is an important thing to do to protect yourself from infection. I think we can build on that. Um, that's an area I think we should all be thinking about. I, I almost wonder if we need a, a Greta Thurberg, you know, the, the young campaigner for, for climate yes, change. Yes. Maybe we need something like that. I, I did have a, a quote that I would really love to perhaps leave you with. Uh, Mark, yeah, go for it. Yeah. It's a young patient. Um, she was a young patient called Rachel who'd suffered from numerous urinary tract infections from age 16. And 
they just weren't ever clearing. And one day she decided, I'm not taking antibiotics anymore. I'm going to treat them with natural products. But I'm going to fast forward the story and, and tell you that unfortunately she ended up in hospital with them um, with septicemia. And so out of that, though, the interesting thing for me was the reaction of the whole family. And I think this illustrates how resistant infection starts to become something that families and individuals understand. Because at that stage, she was shocked herself, but her whole family were shaken. Her mum coped at the time very well, but afterwards she started to worry about every little illness and every little virus that came into the family. So it left her with a fear. Her father had an entirely different reaction. He was actually quite upset and angry and wanted to know whose fault this was. You know, he, it almost it needed somebody to blame. Why did this happen to his daughter? Was it his daughter's fault? In fact, he wondered if she'd done something or hadn't done something. Again, another misguided reaction because none of them understood resistant infection. And then Rachel herself, she had a very interesting reflection a few years later. The good news is she did recover. It took her quite a, a long time, probably about 14 months, but she got on to university and completed it. And then she told me at that stage, she said, before I developed infection resistant to antibiotics and the septicemia, I didn't, I didn't know that antibiotic resistance existed. She said, but I believed it only happened in third world countries or areas of high deprivation, which I now recognize was really naive. She went on to say, she said, I believed I'd always used antibiotics correctly, so I wouldn't have been at risk of antibiotic resistance. How could this have happened to me? The more information I gathered during my own research into this, the angrier I became, realising there was nothing I could do. I realised to my horror that infection caused by bacteria resistant to antibiotics can happen to anybody, even me. So I think for a 21-year-old to have that kind of insight underlines the fact that until we all understand what it really means and that actually it can happen to any one of us, it only at that point are we probably going to be motivated to really get involved in, and fight in this cause. Gosh, well, you know what, Arlene, I'm not even going to try and follow on from that because I think that's, I think, honestly, I think that sums up the whole, the whole episode. So if I may, Look, Arlene, that, that has been an absolutely fantastic overview of the concerns of patients in this area, which just aren't aired enough. So thank you on behalf of all MSD and I'm sure on behalf of all our listeners. Um, it's great there's people out there like you doing this work. It's incredibly essential and I wish you every success in your endeavours and thank you, thank you, thank you. With that, Thank you to our listeners and that's the end of episode two and I look forward to you joining us next time for episode three. Thank you. I'm Mark Johnson and you've been listening to The Stewards brought to you by MSC. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time.